Welcome back to Hypothesis Testing. This is part three, another example. So we have a new machine, and it has been installed to fill boxes with cereal. The amount stated on the box is 400 grams. The new machine was tested by filling 16 boxes, and the contents of each box were weighed. The average weight was 402 grams with a standard deviation of 2 grams. Does it appear that the average weight setting for the machine is different than 400, right? Pretty, pretty uh, standard, pretty important business issue. We don't want to underfill the boxes because then our customers are annoyed as well as we could run into some regulatory issues. We don't really want to overfill too much because you know, then we're sort of giving away product that we're not getting compensated for. So ideally we, want it, we do want to hit it around that 400 grams or certainly not too st statistically significantly different than 400 grams. Okay, so we have standard deviation. No word, no population standard deviation. No Greek symbol sigma. Therefore, the population standard deviation unknown to us. We're in the realm of the t-distribution. Okay, so as is usual, six steps in a hypothesis test, and this is this is big league stat stuff now. We start with step one and then go to step two. Whoa, right? Holy cow, what a what a twist. What a plot twist that is. So we start with step one. What's our HO and what's our HA? Alright. Okay. So we look at our question, right? Because usually, hey, the hypothesis is in the question. Does it appear that the average weight setting for the machine is different than 400 grams? Hey, average weight, universal symbol for that is mu. Different means, hey, not equal to. Right? We're equally concerned. We don't want it to be a lot more than 400. We don't want it to be under 400 either, right? So we're very concerned that it's different than 400. In, in one sense, it's uh, annoying our customers and possibly causing us some regulatory problems. On the other hand, we're, we're uh, basically giving away something for free. HO is the opposite. Is that it's equal to 400 grams in this case. Okay. Step two. We pick a, an alpha, and we'll just kind of we'll continue with an alpha, let's say, of 0 0.02. Okay, and again, we we all appreciate and we understand that there's a quite a bit of sophistication and brain sweat that goes into the proper determination of that alpha, uh, and it is not a trivial exercise. Step three: Which test statistic are we interested in? We do we are we are doing a hypothesis test for the mean. So we've narrowed down our choices to a Z statistic or a T statistic. We do not know the population standard deviation. So Z is out. T is in. T is equal to X bar minus mu zero over S divided by the square root of N. And with the degrees of freedom equals to N minus one. Okay. So we see our X bar, which is 402 grams. So T equals to 402 minus 400. Right? Remember, mu zero is just the 400 that we see in our hypothesis. Divided by, that's our S. S is 2 grams divided by the square root of 16. Degrees of freedom is equal to the 16 minus 1, which equals to our degrees of freedom of 15. Okay. We run through the t, and we get a t, dist a, a t value of 4. Degrees of freedom equals to 15. And step 3 is all set. Step 4, we calculate the p-value. Okay, so we have a couple of different ways again, just like we had before. We could we've got the Excel way, and we've got uh, the um, the table way to do this. Okay, so let's go look at our table first. Okay, so our table is all in terms of of greater than. So the test statistic for the um, P value here is essentially becomes so the p value equals to the probability that we get a test statistic 
greater than the absolute value of our calculated test statistic, and because it's two-tailed, we're going to multiply that by two. Okay, so those are absolute values, so those little straight up and downs. Okay, so our first step is we want to find the probability that t is greater than, and since this is a positive number, it's just greater than four. So that's our first step, and then we will multiply that by two. Okay. Our degrees of freedom is 15, so our journey starts in the degrees of freedom at 15, and we're essentially looking for our test statistic of four along that particular row. So I'm on the row with degrees of freedom is equal to 15, going across, nope, 0.866, ooh, four is much bigger than that. 1.341, again, four much bigger than that one. 1.753, four is bigger than that one. 2.131, four is bigger than that. 2.602, four is bigger than that one too. 2.947, four is bigger than that. So what we do know is the probability that t is greater than 4 is going to be less than 0 0.05. Now, why am I saying less than 0 0.005? Well, I noticed that when I look up here, area in the upper tail, area under a curve in a probability sense, that's just a probability, right? Area under a probability density function, like the t or the z, it's a probability. So those areas in the upper tail are nothing more than probabilities. I also notice that as the t gets bigger, right, the area to the right gets smaller. That makes sense, right? You know, as t gets a bigger number, the amount of space to the right is getting into the smaller and smaller parts of the tail, right? And we see that when we look at these probabilities. So I know that when I have a t statistic that's 4, and it's bigger than the 2.947, which is the largest value along that row where the degrees of freedom is 15, that although I don't know exactly what my probability is here, I do know that it will be a number less than 0.005. Okay. So if you're using tables, that's fine, and, and you know, that, 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 that serves our purposes here, right? What we know now is we have a very, 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 very small p-value. Okay. So we've got a, a very, very small p-value, less than 0 0.005. We multiply that by two, so using tables, the probability the t is a greater than the absolute value of 4, or alternatively, 2 times the probability that t is greater than 4 equal is going to be less than 2 times 0 0.05, which will be less than 0 0.01, okay? Now, uh, that's you, uh, an approximation, right? And, and it, is, it is a crude measure uh, for sure. Uh, and, and Excel gives us a little bit of a nicer uh, look at this. So let's do this on Excel as, uh, as well. So equals to t um, dot dist. Now I use in for when I want uh, a t statistic. I use dist when I want a probability. All right. So this sort of give us some sense for why we use one in the other. Now what's really nice is we kind of see a choice of, of 2t, right? We can do a two-tailed test. And then we just type in our test statistic, our degrees of freedom of 15, and I close it. And right away I get a two-tailed test statistic, right? So the exact p-value, 0 0.001159, right? No approximation there, right? When we when we did that, when we found that it was less than 0 0.005, we had no idea how much less, right? And we multiplied it by two because that's the that's the proper procedure to do it, just to be on the on the safe side, just in case it's only slightly less than 0 0.005. Yeah, we don't know. I mean, we have an idea because 4 is so much bigger than, than 2.947 that it's probably going to be a lot less than 0 0.005, and that turns out that that was definitely the case. Right? So we have, we have two choices here, and uh, obviously we prefer the more exact p-value to the less exact p-value. Step 5 is unchanged regardless of which approach we use. Right? The p-value in this case is definitely less than or equal to alpha, 
right? Regardless of which one you're looking at here, uh, they're both all less than the, the, the 0.02. Uh, therefore, the risk of committing a type 1 error is below our threshold. Therefore, we are very comfortable in rejecting H0 with uh, an alpha of 0 0.02. Okay, so again, the risk of uh, falsely rejecting H0 is below our maximum threshold of alpha. Comfortable then rejecting that H0, and we do so. And uh, we move on to step six. Step six is what do we conclude? Hey, well, we've rejected H0. H0 is gone. So it means, hey, we can accept that HA. So, yes, we can conclude that the average or mean, whatever, average now equals average uh, weight of the serial boxes is different than 400 grams. It is different, right? Now that's problematic for us, right? Because now we're we're not filling it appropriately. Perhaps that now tells us that we need to do some calibration on our equipment uh, to make sure that uh, everything is okay. And that concludes that story. So a couple of things just to just to wrap this all up. Uh, HO and HA are mutually exclusive, so all the world is encompassed between HO and HA, but there's no overlap. Always an equality sign in HO. Uh, one of them must represent completely the claim being assessed. HO is assumed to be true. Right? Not that we, we don't prove it to be true, we assume it to be true, and then it can be rejected or not rejected. HA, on the other hand, it has to be con is considered proven if HO is rejected, right? And uh, and then our concluding statements reflect that, right? It reflects around HA. We have our, we either established what is in HA is correct or true, or we've not established whatever is in HA is correct or true, right? So really, the, the sentence varies by just the word not. <laughs> okay. If you have any questions, always feel free to ask. Oh, hey, I forgot one thing. Um, when we find the p-value, note, uh, it's like we did in the, uh, the first the question, that the uh, direction of the sign is always in whatever is in HA, yeah, so whatever is in the alternative hypothesis. In the two-tail test we just did right now, uh, we went two times by, we found the upper tail only because our tables really give us the upper tail very easily and excel uh, by the nature of what the predominant way that T distributions are used gives us the greater than probability as well. So it was just easier to, to work with it that way. Uh, but, you know, if... If it happens to be less than, uh, then, you know, the same complement rules apply. Okay. Um, sometimes uh, it can be tricky if the sample result f actually fits the null hypothesis. Right? You, get, uh, you get some, especially when you're using tables, you get some numbers that are either uh, getting very, very close to zero or very, very close to one. And we can't really say it's ever zero or ever one. We only ever say it's approximately zero or approximately one. Uh, and so when we use tables, they can be a little bit uh, the tricky when you have really, really large p-values or really, really small p-values. Okay, anyway. Now I think I'm done, although I leave this really wonderful real-life uh, question here if you're into accounting auditing uh, and sampling it's, it's kind it's kind of neat it just sort of tests and, and stretches you out a little bit it, probably a little bit more complicated than one would expect typically at, at this uh, at this level but it's not undoable uh, given your knowledge base so far okay good luck <laughs>